You can turn in your Bible to Colossians chapter 2. Uh, Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5 is where I want to spend some time with you this morning. Uh, it's a joy to be with you. Thanks for, for letting me come in and getting me sick. Um, just kidding, I, I brought that myself. So uh, if I ever cough in this sermon, it's because I had lo mismo. Um, I'm Pastor Isai. Uh, I, I served at Grace Church for the last five, six years in our college ministry. Um, and that's been an immense joy for me. But over the last three months, I've actually had the privilege of shifting over to high school at our church. So I'm, I'm the high school pastor now at Grace. I love it. Uh, it's been awesome. And the gap between college and high school is real. So um, in a good way for you um, and a good way for them too. Um, so I, I love serving there. Um, my wife, Danny, is, is home. She takes care of four babies now. We just had our fourth uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago. And so that's right. Yeah, no, we're excited. Um, and uh, uh, I don't know what sleep is anymore. And that's okay. Um, our oldest, Amariah, is six. The next guy is Ezra. He's four. And then we have uh, Nemo. Um, he's two. And this last baby girl, Aaliyah, uh, is, is a fresh three weeks old. So that's our home. That's who, that's who I am a little bit. If we've never had the chance to meet, we'd love to talk with you after. Um, but the reason I'm standing up here this morning is to, is to teach God's Word. And so Colossians 2 is where I'd like for us to draw our attention. And we'll be looking at verses 1 through 5. And the Word of God reads as follows. Paul writes, for I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments, for though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Pray with me as we enter into this time together. Father, we are grateful indeed. We're grateful that you have provided for us fellowship in this hour. We're grateful that we get to open your word and understand it. We're grateful that we can sing to you of your glories and your excellencies. And above all things, grateful to you for your son. We're grateful that because of Christ, we see the full glory of God. Because of Christ, the Spirit is at work in the lives of believers even now. Because of Christ, not only do we await for heaven, but in the moment we have heaven. Because of Christ, we have everything we need towards life and godliness. So Lord, help us in this hour so that we would be prepared to share that Christ with a broken and dying world. We pray this in your son's matchless name. Amen. Amen. Well, I wanted to begin, uh, you know, this morning. At first, I thought I would ask you if anyone in this room had uh, cash money on, on them right now so that you could bring it up to me. And then I thought, don't, don't do that. Just go ahead and flaunt it. So um, if you can't see this, it's a, it's a Benny. That's right. Um, big time bucks. It's fresh. It's crisp. It looks good. Um, it's also a fake. Um, you know that because on the back it says, in prop we trust, uh, for motion picture purposes. So there are ways for you to tell fake money from real money, and one of the ways you did that now was that I told you, the other was that you saw me holding a $100 bill, and you know that I don't possess that kind of wealth. <laughs> but there are ways to detect that, right? Uh, counterfeit money is something that's very real in our world, and though many of you use debit cards and Venmo, that's still a thing. Uh, in fact, the biggest heist in all of history when it comes to counterfeit money is a $250 million uh, exercise run by a man in Canada, Canadians, um, 
who, hey, no, I love you guys. It's just you, you stole our money and tried to make more of it. And so you, you did what often is done. You made fake money. You made it look like real money. But there are ways to detect those differences. And here's a few of them. One, you could feel the texture of the bill. This feels like just straight paper. Uh, a real dollar bill or a real Benny uh, has, a, has a particular texture to it. Uh, you could compare it with other bills of the same denomination. So you could just look at this in light of another $100 bill, and that'll help you uh, detect which is real and which is fake. You can notice that a real dollar bill, a real, a real bill has uh, not only a texture, but the ink on it is actually a little bit raised. You can feel the grooves of the ink. Whereas a, a fake like this is flat. The ink is printed on and there is no raising of that ink. Uh, you can look for fibers in the paper. Apparently in a real dollar bill, there are actual strands that go inside the paper that denote it to be real currency. And on here, it's just printed on as a blue strip that is not real. Hard to detect with the naked eye, but if you know real money, you can tell fake money. In fact, uh, the person that wrote this article on how to detect the differences between real and fake money uh, concludes it with this. When doing so, you look for differences, not similarities. Counterfeit bills, if they're any good at all, will be similar to real ones in many ways. But if a bill differs in just one way, it's probably fake. You need to spot just one difference to see the fake bill versus the real bill. It goes on to say that the best way for you to detect real money from fake money is to have a good idea of what real money is. I think that's really helpful for us, not just so you don't get scammed with your money. I think that's helpful for us as it relates to you and the gospel. I think that's helpful for you as it relates to you and Christ. And this church in Colossae is undergoing a season in their ministry where some have come in claiming Christ, but a different Christ. Some have come in questioning Christ's supremacy and his sufficiency, an altogether different Christ than the one that they have originally heard about. And Paul's argument for them as he opens up this letter and as he begins this letter to them here, namely in chapter 2, is that if they want to distinguish between the real Christ and the fake Christ, they need to know the real Christ. The emphasis placed by Paul in this letter is that if they're going to be able to withstand the pressures from society, from culture, and even from within their own midst that seek to tamper with the true image of Christ, then they need to know him all the more in truth. Then and only then will they be able to spot the differences. What an important message for you and I. We live in a very similar world. And in these modern Colossian times, there are many arguments. There are many portraits of Christ. There are many reflections of his love and his grace and his mercy in the church that look like him but are not of him. How will you spot the difference? It isn't by coming up with your own arguments. It isn't by trying to decipher the other arguments. You have room to do that, and you'll need to do that, but Paul's first and primary way that you will do that is by knowing Christ. If you don't know him, you can't defend him. If you don't believe in him, how do you expect others to believe in your message? That's Paul's argument in Colossians 2, 1 to 5. He wants this church to recognize that to withstand all the other arguments that come in to tamper with the person and work of Christ, they need more of him. And that's what we'll see this morning. 
I want us to look at that by means of two ways, two ways that Paul delineates it for us. One, it's the Christian's disposition, and two, it's the Christian's discernment. The Christian's disposition and the Christian's discernment. And we could begin by finding great hope for us here in verse 1 of chapter 2. Paul is in prison writing this letter to this church. And he begins with these words in chapter 2, I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face. Here he brings the premise to his argument. As he desires to see in them a Christian disposition, as he desires to see in them a Christian discernment, it's fascinating to see that Paul writes a letter to a group of people he's never met before, which is wonderful news for us, because neither has Paul seen you. And Paul writes to this church because beyond ministry being face-to-face, it's heart-to-heart. And so Paul has a deep-rooted concern for this church, not because he's been with them, because he hasn't, but because Christ is in them. And if Christ is in them, they are of great value to him. And so we see that the words that are before us are, are not just profitable to Colossae or Laodicea or the other churches in that surrounding area. These words have impact to anyone who bears the name of Christ. And what is it that Paul says here he struggles so much for? It's not necessarily that Paul is looking back at his suffering. It's not that he's highlighting his imprisonment. He's highlighting the agony that it is to do ministry. What is it that he agonizes over so much for this church? What does he desire? Uh, Firstly, it's a Christian disposition. He wants them to live, act, look like, be Christians. That if they have claimed Christ, they should walk in Him. Their life should reflect what they believe. Well, what is it that He highlights for us? Well, there's three key things that He highlights as it comes to the Christian's disposition. Number one, it's seen in verse two, that their hearts may be encouraged. Now, we understand what encouragement is, but I think that because we're, um, we're Western civilization, 21st century, um, we often diminish what these words mean. You think of encouragement and you think of um, a time that you've been uh, downtrodden, that you've been cast low, and you needed someone to come alongside you and pick you up. And that's part of it. But being encouraged isn't simply about your emotional state. Being encouraged, and I think here particularly, is more about you being strengthened. It's about you being built up. Paul desires that amidst all the things coming towards this church, they continue to be strengthened. More than comfort. Paul desires that this church grows in its confidence, that they would be encouraged in their hearts. And again, our thinking is, oh, they must be feeling bad, so they need to feel better. That's how we think of heart. That's how we think of encouragement. But encouragement is to strengthen, and heart, it's not simply the the seat of your emotions. In fact, it's not that at all. Heart here, it, it means Everything that you are, it is your personality. It is all of you. It is self. So Paul's desire, it isn't just that when you feel bad, someone comes alongside to make you feel good. It's that in your life, people would come around and build you up in every way into the image of God's Son. That's what Paul desires for this church. That's the disposition that Paul desires to see in the lives of these Colossians. Even as they face other arguments, as they face uh, other uh, reflections of Christ that are erroneous and false, Paul desires that the way to combat that is for them to be strengthened. 
Not merely that their feelings would be met, but that their nature would continuously be transformed. You know, I wonder sometimes as it pertains to our witness, how often others look into the doors of the church and they see a church that claims strength but is very weak. Now, how devastating it would be to wish that others would believe in that which bears so little power in us. We claim Christ and we proclaim Christ and we declare Christ, and yet when people look inside the doors of the church, they see a people who are weak and discouraged. If that's all the world ever sees, they are not beholding him rightly. We, we cry out, take heart, he has overcome the world. And in here, we're constantly despairing. B believe in him and have eternal life. And they look in here, and we are utterly lifeless. This isn't a call for us to lack humility or for us to puff our chest or to tap into towers, powers of positivity. But this is a call to daily give ourselves to depending on Christ. No matter what we face in life, recognizing that he truly can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. It's a dependent kind of strength. It isn't self-willed. It isn't self-actualized. It's the kind of strength that comes from Christ and Christ alone. And if you want your witness to matter, then there must be power in here. The thing that you claim in the world, it must be seen in your life. Don't tell people that Christ can change them and he's never changed you. That makes no sense. That bears no weight. That has no authority. The reason that Christ is so effective the reason that Christ is the only way is because not only is Christ truth, but he transforms. And so part of your witness is this, that you be encouraged in your hearts, that you be strengthened, built up in every way, that your whole life would be given and surrendered to him. I would ask you, do you have the courage to live by his power? Are you willing to open up the window of your life to a watching world, and when they look in, they see Christ at work in you? Do they see someone being strengthened? Do they see a strong-hearted person? I get it. God's people, they may be weak, they may be frail, they may be beaten and bruised, they may be mocked and scored, they may be wounded and hated. But Paul reminds us here, may they always be encouraged. That is our great witness to a watching world. It's that we be encouraged. Now Paul recognizes the way that this works. When we tell a church to be strengthened, it's so quickly that a strong church can easily become a dangerous church if it's not a loving church. A strong church can become a dangerous church if it's not a loving church. And so, secondly here, as to the Christian's disposition, Paul doesn't just want you to be built up. He then says he wants you to be knit together in love. I understand what this looks like. A month or so ago, I went back east for a, a wedding. A buddy of mine was, was getting married. We were thankful. We never saw this day coming. And so we were, we were very well pleased. Um, and so off I go to a wedding. Uh, I'm a groomsman, and as you know, a groomsman has got to look dapper. It's difficult for me, but, you know, I can try to get the merch, and I did. I, I went to a men's warehouse, and I said, I, I hear that you guys can help me look good, and they said, we will try. 
And I said, okay, well, the suit's already picked out. You just need my sizes, right? So we did the whole thing. I, I ordered this suit. They deliver it to my house, ship it to my house a solid three months before the wedding. Um, you know, groom is checking in every two weeks because he's so nervous asking, you know, are you guys ready? And I say, absolutely. I got the suit. I'm going to look great. It's going to be phenomenal. It's in a box. I can't wait. And so I travel out east, and the night before the wedding, I decide we should open the box. It would be a good idea to open the box. Probably this is the hour to open the box. Right, Mom? I'm, I'm at my parents' house. Open the box. Take out the suit. The jacket, fresh. I mean, I'm, I'm looking great already. It's, it's coming together. Get the pants out. Put those things on. And we have a major problem. The garment, you see how here, right? Like, I mean, obviously, like, I don't know how to talk about fashion, as you can tell. But it, it's, it's supposed to be at my ankle. Well, the thing went all the way out to the 14. It hadn't been... <laughs> It hadn't been hemmed yet. It wasn't, it wasn't whatever the words you would use to describe this. All I know is that I looked like a mess. I looked like a clown. And the wedding was the next day. So, Puerto, R Puerto Rican mama does what a Puerto Rican mama does. Ay, Dios mío. Oh, my goodness, nay. What are we going to do? I don't know. I, mom, I, listen, if you don't know, trust me, we're, then we're toast. Because I don't know. I mean, I can, you want me to eat part of it? Like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> Mom just took over. She fixed it. Somehow she knitted it together so I didn't look like a mess. She, she, she was able to fix it in some way, knitting the garment in some way that I went to wedding day and nobody noticed except for the fact that I have a big mouth and I love telling the story. <laughs> didn't say it on wedding day because that would be too much stress. The point is, she took something that was a mess, and she brought it together, very literally. And that is, in fact, Paul's point here. A strong church is one thing. A loving church is a completely other thing. And for us to look the way that Christ wants us to, we must be knit together, or else we are a mess. And that's not all. If we are not knit together in the bond of Christ that has been given to us, in the love that not only does God call us to, but God dis displays for us in the life of His Son, if we do not do that, why would the world believe in Him? To live as a body that is knit together, is to be a reflection of the glorious power that Christ has to bind people who otherwise would never be bound. Francis Schaeffer calls the unity of the church the final apologetic. And he writes these words based on John 17 where Jesus prays for us to be one as he is one. He writes, if the world does not observe this unity among true Christians, the world has a right to make two awful judgments which these verses indicate. That we are not Christians and that Christ was not sent by his Father. That we be bound is necessary. And not only so, but it is also necessary that we be bound in love. There is much room for us to disagree. There is much room for us to be different. Black, white, Puerto Rican, Asian, it all exists here. Different cultures, different likes, different favorite foods, different favorite musics. Different favorite sports, maybe no love for sports. Uh, different ways in which you think it's best to approach someone and comfort them in their time of need. Different ways that you would approach someone with the Word of God to call out their sin. Different ways that you would uh, approach someone to help them when, when they feel like uh, their, their struggle is something they cannot overcome. That's fine. In all of it, be knit together 
in love. Jesus has commanded it of us. John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you, love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. Why? By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. He goes on to pray in John 17 from which Schaefer speaks. He desires that we be one just as the Father and Him are one that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. You want the world to believe in Jesus? Great. Love one another. Be committed to each other. Devote yourselves to each other. And don't just love in word, but also in deed. Love that flows from the mouth is cheap. Love that has hands and feet. Now that matters. Love is reflected in how you serve one another, how you care for each other. And if you claim Christ in the world, but all they see here are egos and selfishness, why would they want that? They already have that. Be knit together in love. This is our witness to a watching world. It is strong hearts. It is loving unity. Thirdly, Christian, the Christian's disposition is an anchored assurance. It's an anchored assurance. Strong-hearted Christians, knit-together Christians, they're striving towards something. Paul desires something very particular for them, and it's that they would reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. God desires that you would be strong in the Lord. He desires that you would be united with each other. And he desires these things so that your heart would be certain of who Christ is and what he does. You want assurance and be strong in him. Be knit together in love and dive re- deeply into the riches of full assurance that are granted to us as we understand and know God through his son. If you want to know that you're saved, it's not by looking inwardly. It's by looking outward toward him. This is assurance that comes from understanding God as he's revealed himself. And so you're strengthened, yes. You're encouraged, yes. You're being knit together, yes. You love one another, yes. And all of this only because you understand and know Christ. You have believed upon the Son. You have witnessed what God has revealed in him, and you have said, I believe. You know, many struggle with the idea of assurance. And I'm not going to get lost in that concept, but it is here to remind us that assurance also has an impact on our witness. As we are assured in Christ, as we demonstrate confidence in Christ, others will want the same. And if that's a struggle for you, there might be many reasons. I think none more than what is expressed here. It's not only that assurance comes from being strengthened and knit together. It's that assurance comes from understanding. What what does it mean to understand something? Well, it's not just that you know what to do. It's that you know how to put it to use. It's not that you you understand something intellectually. If you were to have understanding, you were to know something, but then you were to do something with it. If you know that a train is coming, you would not step in front of it. That's called not being dumb and understanding. Many of you claim to know Christ, but your life doesn't reflect that you understand him. 
I wonder how many of you walk with your Bibles across this campus every day, but you rarely live by it. You hear a lot, but you do nothing. James 1, declares against this, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. The mark of all true belief is righteous living. And in kind, the assurance of true faith is found in a faithful life. You want to know that you're saved? Live like you know that. Live in a way that would honor Christ and who He is. Your life should reflect what you know. We live our lives on the basis of that day in and day out. And so many of us in this room claim Him, but our life, does it reflect in truth that we know Him? If you know Christ, prove it. It's not because in doing so you'll save yourself or that, that adds in any way to what Christ has offered you. No. It's because what Christ has offered you is that not only will you get there one day to be with Him in eternity, but it's that He has promised to dwell in you richly now so that you would be given to love and good works. You need Christ just as much as anyone else. And if others are to come to believe in Him, they must see that He bears much power in your life, that He strengthens you, that He binds us together, and that He not only has saved us, but He is utterly transforming us. The world may not want to hear it, but He is all we have. And He's all we have because He's all we need. Paul argues this in verse 3. Find yourselves in assurance of faith and this in the person of Christ. Why? Because in Him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The world is coming and knocking on our door looking for answers. They, they come to us seeking some kind of truth. They, they come to us wanting to know, what is it that you believe? What is it that you hold to? How does it fit into all the things that we hold to? What answers can you offer us? And, and I'm concerned that when the world comes with a penny for your thoughts, you offer back your two cents. You could give them so much more. Give them Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. They don't need your opinion. They don't need your perspective. They don't need your thoughts. They need Him. They want justice. Give them Christ. They want rights. Give them Christ. They want love. Give them Christ. They want hope. Give them Christ. There is nothing the world could ask for that isn't already provided for in Christ. Everything the world longs for is bound to a person and his work, and his name is Jesus. Don't give them less when you can give them infinitely more. Give them Christ. Give them the one that's at work in you. Give them the one who is head of the church. Give them the one who made the world. Give them the one who governs all things. Give them the one who by his power holds all things together. And don't give them anything less. This is the Christian's disposition. Why does it matter? Because day after day, there will absolutely be those that step into the church to question your faith and to question Him. 
day after day, there will be arguments presented in the church that seem good, that seem to make sense, but are completely contrary to who Christ is and what he's doing. And so, Paul not only desires that we have Christian dispositions, Paul desires that we have Christian discernment. This is shown to us here in verse 4. I say all this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I'm absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. I'm going to turn and pray for individual right now. It seems like things aren't going super well. So, Lord, I pray that you just be with uh, uh, this precious member and soul that belongs to you. Uh, be help and be of aid in this hour. Uh, help us to continue to be attentive to your word, but also to be concerned uh, always for those around us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul's desire is not only for you to have certain Christian dispositions, he desires for you to have a very particular Christian discernment. Why it matters so much that you would give yourselves to being strengthened and knit together and having full assurance and full confidence in the person and work of Christ. He says in verse 4, it's because there's all kinds of arguments that will make their way in that look good but are not of God. And it doesn't take a lot for me to demonstrate what these might be. These are plausible arguments. In other words, they're sensible. They're persuasive. They sound good. They're enticing. They're convincing. They make a whole lot of sense. Maybe they sound a little bit like this. My body, my choice. I promise you, friends, this is not only out there. That's an argument in here. And that seems to make a lot of sense until you recognize that none of us would be here if it weren't for the fact that Colossians 1.16 says, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth. All things created through him and for him. And so it isn't my body my choice. My body belongs to him. And it's governed by Him, created for Him. Maybe you've heard it this way. Love wins. That seems to sound pretty good. And I think we would often, we would actually agree with that maybe. Absolutely love wins. We desire that. We hope that love wins. And then you come to realize that the terms are being skewed. The arguments that's being made, it's not simply that love in the way we understand it wins, but affirming people and accepting people and taking people simply as they are, tolerating everything, that's what wins. It's not the love we know in Christ. If you love him, you keep his commandments. You don't get to do as you please. You are freed from your sin, but you are also now a slave to Christ. And that is the most loving thing that God could do for his creatures. And so love wins, but that's not the argument that we often hear in the church. It's not the argument that begins to seep its way through its doors. Or maybe you've heard it this way. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. That one's dicey because that's Bible. <laughs> so it would make a whole lot of sense when someone brings up the argument for you to love your neighbor as you would love yourself, that you would go, oh my goodness, that's true. Yeah, they're right. I, I, I can't believe that this whole time I've been so disrespectful to my neighbor. And no one's calling you to be a jerk or disrespectful to your neighbor. But you should love your neighbor like Christ loved his neighbor. Not to watch her live in sin, but to watch her be rescued and washed and purified and cleansed. To grow up to be brought out of that sin and to live unto righteousness, that's true love. And those arguments make their way in the church. And Paul's desire is that you would have great discernment to see it. 
How will you know when those arguments are false? How will you know when the things that are being spoken to you, maybe even in your midst, are fallen off the true path given to us through Christ? Paul's answer, you need to know Christ. If you're going to discern, if you are going to reject being deceived by those sensible arguments that come in, you won't give yourself to human reasoning. You will give yourself all the more to Christ. You won't give yourself to arguing at their level. You will give yourself to winning them for Him. You won't give yourself to making yourself look good or to make it seem like you know everything. You'll give yourself to highlighting and pointing to Christ. If they want answers, which they do, Paul's argument is to give them Christ. This is what we must do. We hold fast to these Christian dispositions, and we guard ourselves with this discernment so that in everything we would make Christ known, that others would see Christ at work in us. And when others seek to tamper with the person and work of Jesus, when they would seek to tamper with the message that is clearly delineated through the Scriptures, we wouldn't simply want to win arguments but we would want to win souls. That we would be less interested in being right and we would be more interested in then seeing Him as the righteous one. That, that our desire would not simply be to come out on top, but it would be to show that Christ is on top. Highlight Christ. He is our chief apologetic. You want to make a defense? Let Jesus do it. He's better at it. I promise you, he's been at it for a long time and he's doing a good job. Get out of Jesus' way and let Jesus do the work that he must do. He will build his church. He will defend her and you get to play a part in it. What's your role? Show them Christ. It's the beauty of verse 5. Paul encourages them in this way because he sees this in them. And though he hasn't been with them in body, he's with them in spirit. He's rejoicing to see their good order and the firmness of their faith in Christ. I love it because here Paul turns to a, a bit of a militaristic language. And I think that's a good place for us to land the plane, so to speak. We are called to go. We are called to defend. And here in this way that Paul speaks as we stand in good order and firmness of faith, we're reminded we are waging war. I just pray that we do so in the right way. Be a soldier for Christ. Be a defender of the faith. And do so not so that you look good, not so that you look right, Not so that people can say, wow, how smart, wow, how biblical, wow, how awesome is that guy? Wow, she's like a, she's like a theologian. She is the second coming of Elizabeth Elliot. That's fine, but if they didn't get Christ, they got absolutely nothing. Your goal is Christ. Let him make his own defense. He has He came from the Father. He came for the world. He gave his life as a ransom for many so that many would come to faith in him. And see, we cannot argue against the one true Son of God. If you've seen that, live in light of it and declare that to the world. Father, thank you for this time we've had in your word. Thank you that Jesus, Jesus is worthy and matchless and precious and there is nothing that compares to him. 
Thank you that because of Christ, the church is being conformed into his image. And because of Christ, so many others are being drawn in. Hey, Lord, may it never be that they're being drawn in because simply of us, but they would be drawn in because of your work in us. That when they see us, what they truly see is Christ. And Lord, may he be our goal as we seek to defend the faith and proclaim the faith. That above our own faith, we would point to its object and that Christ in all his glory would compel others to come in. Help us to be devoted, to being strengthened in our being, to being knit together in love, to having assurance of faith, to being those who look to Christ for our own sake, but also for the sake of the world. And in that, helping us to guard ourselves from the many things that would seek to tamper with the truth of Christ. Lord, you have saved us, you will sanctify us, and you will defend us. We're thankful for that in this hour. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.